Do you like Kemper? I like Kemper. You were able to appear like a ordinary person, non-threatening to... I lived as an ordinary person most of my life, even though I was living a parallel and increasingly sick life, other life. One victim let me back in the car. I locked myself out. She opened the door for me. My gun was under the seat. What in the hell am I doing telling you that? Am I looking, am I, am I a masochist? Am I looking to be tormented further? I'm trying to show you just how awful this got, how commanding these rages got. I was raging inside. There was just incredible energies, positive and negative, uh, depending on a mood that would trigger one or the other. And outside, I looked troubled at times. Other times, I looked moody. Uh, other times, perfectly serene. Not very sane. But again, people weren't even aware of what was happening. In 1972 and 1973, a series of murders shocked Northern California. College girls began to disappear while hitchhiking. Two of the victims were picked up from the campus of the University of California at Santa Cruz. That's where Ed Kemper's mother was working as an administrative assistant. You were involved in the campus because your mother worked there? Yes. I was also involved in killing co-eds because my mother was associated with college work, college co-eds, women, and had had a very strong and violently outspoken position on men for much of my upbringing. My mother was a, a sick, angry, hungry, and, and very sad woman. I hated her, but I wanted to love my mother. And I watched the alcohol increase, I watched her social life drop off, I watched her get bizarre. She had terrible pain from her life, earlier life, her upbringing, uh, a failed marriage with my father. I'm a constant reminder of that failure. I hate to distill it down into such uh, into one word realities like that. There's a lot that leads into that happening, but that is what happened. They represented not what my mother was, but what she liked, what she coveted, what was important to her, and I was destroying it. Why did you actually kill the girls? My frustration, my inability to communicate socially, sexually. I wasn't impotent, but emotionally I was impotent. I was scared to death of failing in male-female relationships. I knew absolutely nothing about that whole area. Even if just sitting down and talking with the young lady. I need to be able to really communicate, and ironically enough, that's why I began picking people up. And I'm picking up young women, and I'm going a little bit farther each time. It's a daring kind of a thing. At first there wasn't a gun. I'm driving along. We go to a vulnerable place where there aren't people watching, where I could act out, and I say, no, I can't. And then a gun is in the car, hidden. And this craving, this awful, raging, eating feeling inside. I could feel it consuming my insides. This fantastic passion uh, it was overwhelming me. It was like drugs. It was like alcohol. A little isn't enough. At first it is. And as you adjust to that, psychologically and physically, you take more and more and more. It's the same process. So it finally came down to the thing of, do I dare bring this gun out? Already realizing if that gun comes out, something has to happen. It was going to happen. I didn't see it then, but it was going to happen. I was playing a dangerous game with a loaded gun that got us all. On one occasion, Kemper picked up two roommates in Berkeley. In that first killing in May of 72, when that gun was pulled out, I launched it out. For it. I had it under my leg, out of sight, parallel to my, to my leg in the seat. It was something that had been thought out in fantasy, acted out, felt out hundreds of times before it ever happened. Kemper drove them at gunpoint to a secluded area near a park. He took one of them into the woods, leaving the second girl tied in the car. I'd just gone through a horrible experience with her roommate, stabbing her. 
And I was in shock because of that. I couldn't believe that it was that way. And I'm walking back there bewildered. I gotta kill her. I can't let her go. She's gonna tell on me. Everybody's gonna get me. She sees the blood on my hands. What are you doing? And she pulled back and she gasped. And I think, whoa, I don't want her to know what happened. I said, your friend got smart with me. She'd been getting really smart with me a lot, but I never hit her. I killed her, but I didn't hit her. I said, your friend got smart with me and I hit her. I think I broke her nose. You better come help. She's about to die. Why, do, why does she have to know that? I couldn't deal with telling her that. And when I attacked her, she didn't at first realize what was happening. It didn't go through. She had very heavy coveralls on. It knocked her right up into the lid of the car, but it didn't pierce the clothing. So it wasn't that swell a knife anyway. I went out and bought a, a pawn shop huge knife. And uh, I kept on just mindlessly attacking. She falls back into the trunk. I just killed a young woman. I slammed down the lid of the trunk. She isn't dead. She's dying. And I panicked. I thought, I just locked the car keys in because I can't find them in my pocket. Oh, my God, I locked them in the trunk. I'm kicking on the trunk lid and yanking on it. Oh, no, I don't believe this. I started to run, and I tripped over the gun that I'd had in my pants that I had totally forgotten was there. I stopped. I said, stop and think. I collected my wits. Check all your pockets. I picked the gun up. I stuck it back in my pants, now remembering I had one. I checked all my pockets, and there's the keys in the back pocket. I never put them in my back pocket. Everyone makes mistakes, and that's what we have to hope for. The more mistakes they make, the better, better their chances. I thought I was pretty slick, and went and tripped all over myself, that first two murders. The first 24 hours, there were three clear times I should have been busted, and I wasn't. Because three different individuals, or three different groups of people, got scared and minded their own business and looked the other way. Some of the people who are committing murders, even as we speak, if they're doing it by themselves and they tell no one about it, they could go on undetected until they decided to stop. And the police wouldn't catch them unless we just happened to roll up on them while they were doing it. Even after police warnings against hitchhiking and an increased bus schedule on the campus, Kemper had no trouble picking up hitchhikers. Ironically, one warning advised riding only in cars with university stickers. Kemper's car had such a sticker. My mother worked at the campus and I had an A sticker on my car and obvious access day or night to the campus. I was picking up some very lovely young women. You know what we were talking about as we're driving around? Almost as often as not, this guy that's going around doing this stuff. And the second they started talking that, they didn't realize it, but they were getting a free ride. I couldn't touch that with a 10-foot pole, I swear, you know. But they'd be telling me what all about this guy, and they're comparing notes and speculating on what he looks like, how he carries himself, why he's doing this stuff, telling me about it. So how come they get in a car with somebody at that time? She judged me not to be that guy. I didn't look like him. It. it was getting easier to do. I was getting better at it. I was getting less detectable. I started flaunting that invisibility, severing a human head, two of them, at night in front of my mother's residence, with her at home, my neighbors at home upstairs, their picture window open, the curtains open, 11 o'clock at night, the lights are on, all they have to do is walk by, look out, and I've had it. Why did you keep the heads? Why did you cut them off, and why did you keep them? Something out of my childhood. Um, I could put it on an incident. I mean, my father chopping the heads off of our two pet chickens and my mother insisting that I eat them for dinner. Uh, <laughs> you know, we could say it was something that simple. I don't think it was. Now, my dad heads out back with a hatchet. I got on my bike and I rode I tried to stop it. I remember that. I got on the bike, rode around the block. I was crying. I haven't talked about that for a lot of years. I'm sure that may have implemented something. That may have gotten something rolling but along fantasy lines, but it took a lot of years of development along those lines to really get off. But how are you able to, in one minute, have someone's head in your hand and very shortly thereafter? Living through a fantasy, however that would relate to that severed 
head. And then five minutes later, I'd put that away, and th there'd be a knock on the door, and I'd put it away and answer the door, and the landlady would be there, and we'd discuss it. Discuss what? Reality. Her reality, not mine. Some people go crazy at that point. I felt it. It was one hell of a tweak. I mean, to just flip out and not know where I was, to be walking up the stairs with a camera bag that belonged to a young woman that had her severed head in it, walking up to my apartment past a happy young couple coming down the stairs who nodded and smiled at me as they went by. Good evening. And they're going out on a date where I'd love to be going. And I'm aware of both of these realities and the, dis the distance between those two is so dramatic, so amazing, so violent that that really, I could feel the wheels squeaking inside. That was really pulling on it. And I imagine at that point some people break. But I didn't literally go insane. I didn't get lost. And all this time, Kemper was able to seem normal. He even hung out at a bar across the street from the courthouse, making friends with policemen, trying to pick up information. They'd buy me a beer, I'd buy them a beer. Uh, casual relationships, but that was, I was poking around a little bit, trying to find some things out. I knew they wouldn't be privy to hot information, but there were some things that were bothering me, like were there any speculations on how they were dying? Did the cops like you? Like I said, a friendly nuisance. I got in the way and it was deliberate. Again, friendly nuisances are dismissed. How did you get the knowledge to outsmart the police? Watching television, believe it or not. Joseph Wambaugh, police story. Got some tremendous insights into not just the gimmicks, the actual things, the tidbits that you would pick up from their procedures, but the mechanics behind that, the logic behind it, was I would not allow myself to walk into even a potential trap of behavior. And one of those was talking about those crimes too much to people, initiating conversations about that. There was a, a memorial service for two of the victims. Yes. Were you tempted to go? Yes. But? I'd uh, seen one too many episodes of one too many crime shows where that is one of the available resources for clues. Tracking down the attenders, take one man taking pictures of the people there to eliminate as potential suspects. Some police department, now they actually came to your house to pick up a, a handgun. Sheriff's representatives. One of the detectives was upset because he heard I had a 44 Magnum pistol and was a convicted man. He came to take the gun away and it was on uh, he and his sergeant detective. They were staking out the wrong house. It was across the street and I'm playing around with the car, standing next to the gun in the trunk. They come over and ask me about, uh, excuse me, sir, uh, do you know who lives in this house across the street here? Well, that house was 609 Harriet. He crossed back over to this side into 609 Ord, and they were looking for me and didn't even know that, see what I mean? Bad news. Well, at any rate, we walk into the house to have them ask my mother about this other house, and I'm saying, hey, which 609 are you looking for? And they said, are you Ed Kemper? Yes. And it goes on. And uh, I needed to find out what they were looking for, the murder weapon, the 22 automatic, or the 44 Magnum. And I don't want to advertise that I've got a whole bunch of guns. Uh, so I made a comment to, to divine between the two. And uh, I said, yes, yeah, quite a little gun, isn't it? And he retorted, well, 44 Magnum, I hope so. And I said, Phew, okay because that loaded 22 was under the front seat and guaranteed me an arrest right on the spot. And uh, 44 was in the trunk. I forgot that. I took him in the house, we went into my bedroom, and the closet doors open, and I have a high-powered rifle with a scope on it. You had some other stuff in the house too, yes? Yeah. I had the personal effects and identification of the last two co-eds that had been murdered about two months before right next to the guns in the closet, in a box. Could he have seen it? No, but when he arrested me for having all those guns and went through the rest of the closet looking to see if there were any pistols or anything else, he wouldn't have, couldn't have helped notice a purse, a book bag, and co-ed ID inside of those belonging to their two latest murder victims. I'd back up and said, oh, excuse me. I just remembered, so 
And instantly he responds to what I'm saying, my hand moves, back we go outside, and he's still thinking, boy, this is a really nice and helpful guy here. Uh, some of these people uh, do what you and I do to become better killers. They practice their trade. Didn't Kemper stop himself uh, toward the end of his career? Kemper says he did. He says he could have gone on. He said he had fantasies of killing uh, uh, dozens more people, of leaving a trail of bodies across the country, and at one point he just got on the telephone and turned himself in. He said it was time for the killing to stop. In his case, he said uh, publicly that it was his mother that he was killing all along. And when he killed his mother, uh, that was the end. It's a very deep psychological observation from himself. It, it may be very accurate. It was springtime. It was April. Uh, and for two months, I hadn't killed. And I said, it's not going to happen to any more girls. It's got to stay between me and my mother. And it's got to, I can't get away from her. We're still fighting. She's still belittling me. She's still, I'm like a puppet on a string, and I entertain her. She knows all my buttons, and I dance like a puppet with that pain. And it had even gotten physical to where I had physically grabbed her and thrown her onto her bed, trying to emphasize a point that she's I was threatening to kill her. So here I pick up these two young ladies in Berkeley on Ashby Avenue. One has flowers in her hand, petite little dolls. They're in granny dresses, and they're hitchhiking, a couple of real experts. I want to see how together I am, if I can resist this temptation. You going to Walnut Creek? Great. And they get in my car. They want to go one way. I know they need to go the other. If they go the way they're insisting on, we're headed right back out to where the first two co-eds were murdered. And I'm saying to myself, oh my God, all I got to do is relax and they'll take me to their death. I've got the gun in the car, the same one I've been doing it with. I insisted as gently as I could, I took them where they needed to go, to their college. Hey, thanks. Hey, thanks a lot. That was one week before I murdered my mother. I said, she's got to die and I've got to die or girls like that are gonna die. And that's when I decided I'm going to murder my mother. I knew a week before she died, I was gonna kill her. And she went out to a party, she got soused, she came home, went to sleep. I was woken up by that, I got, came out. I walked up to her bed, she's laying there reading a paperback. As many thousands of nights before. And she said, Oh, I suppose you're going to want to sit up all night and talk now. Shit. I looked at her. I said, no. I said, good night. And I knew I was going to kill her. You know? And I'm so cold. It's so hard. And that's the first time in 10 years I've looked at it that way. I mean, that intensely, that honestly. Because I'm not a lizard, I'm not from under a rock. I came out of her vagina. See? I came out of my mother. And in a rage, I went right back in. For seven years, she said, I haven't had sex with a man because of you, my murderous son, is one of our arguments. And I cut off her head and, I'm, and I humiliated her corpse. It's there. You know? A six young woman dead because of the way she raises her son and the way her son is raised, the way he grows up. And what's her closing words? I suppose you want to sit up all night and talk. God, I, don't, I wish I had. Hmm? Your grandmother and her daughter in law, your mother, were two women very important in your life, and you killed them both. Could you say what they were like that led them to the same fate? Same thing that kept them from ever being friends. They were both aggressive, um, matriarchal women. They'd been the daughters of strong, matriarchal women. I still loved my mother, and it's hard for somebody to comprehend that you murder your mother through love. It isn't a rational process. It's a very painful process. It isn't rational. And I've got to still live with that. Why did you wind up giving yourself up? 
it had to stop. It had to stop. Uh, once my mother was dead, there was almost a cathartic process at that point. I got physically ill right then when she died, when I murdered her. And once she was dead, there was no way I could back out. I had backed down from giving up a thousand times. You know, I used to get drunk and go sit out in front of the sheriff's department in a parking lot across the street on one of those little concrete parking berms. And I'd just sit there and say, no, I still can't. The clanging doors, I could still hear them. No, because it'll never open again. You know, so I, I, I uh, rationalized that to give up would be insane. To give up would be crazy. I'd be giving away my freedom, and I don't need to. But I look back on that and wish I had earlier, when I was saying those things to myself. The people who were later dead wouldn't be. The regret that came later would have not had to be. Those people, not things, those people would still be with their families, with their loved ones. They would have their own families. If I had had the courage to make that decision, instead of painting myself into the corner. Where might you be if you'd never given in to the impulse to murder? Where might I be? If my parole had been successful, uh, I believe I'd be married, I'd have children, I'd be heading toward my first grandchildren. Ed Kemper was detained in a mental hospital from the age of 21 for the murder of his grandparents, but was later released in the advice of psychiatrists. Within two years, he had decapitated and mutilated six students as well as his mother and her best friend. He sometimes raped the corpses. In 1973, he gave himself up since when Ed Kemper has been detained in a reform hospital in California. Vacaville Prison near San Francisco is the largest prison in the West with around 10,000 inmates. Ed Kemper teaches computer science here and takes part in a program recording literature for the blind, all of which will help him earn early remission. Hi. My younger sister's two years younger. And I developed some morbid games. Um, my life had started going that way at about eight. At a certain time of the evening, the family left the center room, the, the living room of the house. My mother and my sisters, or my sisters themselves, would go up to bed upstairs, where I used to go to bed, upstairs. I had to go down to the basement. And an eight-year-old child had a tough time differentiating the reason in that. Why am I going to the basement? I'm going to hell, they're going to heaven. And what were those games that you played with your sister? Okay. Well, the one I remember uh, someone talking about in a, in a book was one that was playing gas chamber or electric chair or something. And we had this big old overstuffed chair up in my room. And we'd, we'd uh, it was and not just my sister and I, it was my sister and I and a friend close friend. We got into all these games. We got into one game where we'd roll up in a rug and a person who would try to get out of it is just like a large throw rug. And it was, uh, I guess, what fascinated us individually about it is it was a completely, uh, it broke up the monotony, I guess, of what we were doing. Didn't have a lot of toys to play with. Uh, we got bored with those pretty quickly. So we looked for things to do. You roll up in the rug and, and you try to get out and the other two would leave the room and we see who could get out fastest. You know, you try to work your way out sideways or scoot out the end of it or whatever. And uh, we went from that to being tied in this overstuffed chair with a cord or something or, or pieces of sheet or sash or something. And uh, we went through this process. I guess we're, that's back when, in 1960 when uh, Carol Chessman was executed. What were those fantasies? What were they? Yes. Um, possessing the severed heads of women. Men didn't turn me on. That wasn't very, I couldn't appreciate the appearances of a guy. 
that when I was young, I was about eight or nine years old, I went to a, this little, come on, it was like at a record store or something, and they had this crowd of kids there, and there was a magic show. And this guy, you've probably seen it, the fake guillotine, hand pressed, and they put the potato there, and someone puts their neck in the, uh, in the brace, and they slam this thing down, and the potato down below chops in two, but the person's head doesn't fall off, right? And everybody gets very fascinated by that. Oh, my God. And then when he puts the blade in place and he pushes it down, it goes through that neck hole. But it never chops anybody's head off. Okay, so he wanted a volunteer out of the... I'm not standing in this crowd watching this show. And he wanted a volunteer out of the audience. And some quite beautiful little 16-year-old girl gets up there and this big laugh and you know, all giddy and stuff. And I started getting caught up in this. I said, wow. Right at that moment, I departed reality because logically, I should have been able to ascertain that that could not happen. You're not going to get away with chopping somebody's head off in the middle of, uh, <laughs> in the middle of Helena, Montana, the capital city. Um, but the concept of it was so raw and it was titillating. I says, "Wow, Jake, I gotta watch this." And he had her girlfriend come over and put her hands there to catch her head so it wouldn't fall in the basket. You know. And he was making jokes about this. I got caught up in this, this, um, this interplay between normal concerns. You don't want to get a bump on her head. Well, hey, if you're chopping her head off, it doesn't matter, right? And this is catching in my mind somehow, and I'm saying, wow. Uh, the first time, okay, uh, the two girls were killed around 6 p.m. By 11 the next morning, they are both completely gone out of my life, physically, all right? That's not even 24 hours. The third murder, which is the second incident, okay uh i'm in the middle of trying to get my record sealed right thursday night i killed her i took off friday i didn't go to work i called in sick took cto all right dismembered her body got rid of her body but kept her head in her hands because they're identifiable they're highly identifiable i kept those at the apartment okay that friday night I, uh thursday night i took her Friday, uh, Friday morning she was dismembered. Friday night she was disposed of, right? Saturday morning I left, right? And I didn't have, I wasn't satisfied that I, I took the head along in the hands, but I didn't, I couldn't put them someplace that I would, could be sure they wouldn't be dug up by an animal or just be somewhere. It was, it's scary going out there trying to bury somebody or dispose of body parts in a community or out in the, even in the boonies where you don't know where you're at and who can come up at any moment. I had some real close calls there. Or people that come out of nowhere and if they if a body's found and they remember this beige looking car sitting there the night that's evidence so it was very very hard to get rid of this stuff so anyway saturday morning i went to see the psychiatrist in fresno saturday afternoon i saw the other one saturday evening i'm with my fiance and her family over in turlock sunday night i come back to my apartment could you tell us how long you've been in prison <clears throat> excuse me uh, this month is 18 years that I've actually been in prison. What were you convicted of? Eight counts of first degree murder. Um, what was your sentence? Seven years to life, um, CC, that's called uh, concurrent. It means all the sentences run at the same time. Two years uh, before you committed the crimes, uh, I think you traveled quite a lot on the freeways at night or picking up hitchhikers during the day during the day yeah i traveled a lot because i'd been locked up for five and a half years i'd never had a license well i just gotten a license when i got locked up the first time a montana license and uh, uh, so i was free the driving around was a, a way to exhibit that freedom to demonstrate it to get the cobwebs out of me when I first got out, I loved to drive. I always did love as a kid to drive. I started driving when I was 10 or 12 years old, but I got a license when I was 15 up in Montana, and then I got locked up and then uh, here in California. And I got out, got a license, and I just started driving. And that was my main hobby, I'd say. And I saw a lot of people out hitchhiking, and I didn't select girls to pick up. I picked up anybody who wanted a ride. And over that whole three-year period, it was the same way. If someone needed a ride, I picked them up. Unless specifically, I was looking for someone to do in. The crimes are, it, it goes from, uh, from May to May September. 7th. May 7th, Sunday, 
to Thursday, September 14th. Then it hops over to January, right? And then to February. It's speeding up. It's coming to a head. It's getting to where, uh, it wasn't a cyclical thing, but it was coming to where uh, it was coming more often. And something I didn't tell a whole lot of people, I guess I did tell in one interview, uh, shortly before it all ended, I drove up to the Bay Area, and I was, well, I was living there, I was up in, in Alameda, but I was living with my mother in Santa Cruz and commuting because I had to work up there, and I stayed with a friend. I went out to Berkeley, and I drove Ashby Avenue, one of the places I used to drive, looking for co-eds. And I drove from uh, Highway 80 up Ashby Avenue to Highway 13. The first two co-eds I killed were on Ashby Avenue. They were five foot two, slight of figure, you know, uh, we call petite. And, and one's black hair, one's blonde hair, okay? And I'm driving the opposite direction up Ashby Avenue. It's a year later. I'm seeing if I can maintain. I'm not hunting. I'm out seeing if I can maintain. I have a weapon in the car. I have everything else fitting the, the situation. I'm seeing if I can maintain. If I can just let go of it and maintain and marry this young lady and go on. I go driving up there and here's these two young ladies, five foot two, one's got blonde hair, one's got black hair. They're in granny dresses and I'm having shit fits because it's like deja vu. And I, oh my God, I just, I acted in a way that they wouldn't be paranoid because I'm a young man by myself in this car. I diffused the situation as I drove up. I'd gotten practice at that, all that driving around. It wasn't rehearsing. I made a game out of driving around, picking people up. And later on, I discerned that some people wouldn't get in my car because of the situation. I'm a young man by myself. It's unsafe. So I thought, well, gee, I, you know, that kind of put me off. I'm not doing anything to anybody. So I want to see if I can change that situation where they'll want to get in and I can take them where they're going. Because I know I'm not going to do anything. And I got to where I could diffuse that situation. It's how you're looking. If you look, oh boy, I already start cranking the car over there. They're not going to get in your car because they can see you from half a block away drooling. But if you look at your watch and say, geez, I don't know if I have enough time, and you're kind of in the mirror and looking around, ah, and you pull over, eh, this guy's just a businessman going somewhere. and get in his car, we'll go where we're going. And it's little games I played so they get in the car. And then we chatted, and I talked about things, and I found out where their orientations were, and their little, what they used to judge, and who could get in, and who they could get in with, and who they couldn't, right? In that sense, it's been interpreted as, as, uh, as what do you call it, rehearsing. It's not true. It's like playing chess, and then turning it into something ugly. I played chess casually. I played chess more and more thoroughly until I got very good at it, which was picking up people, to where I could make you a bet. I can pick up those two ladies, and they'd say, oh, man, you're crazy. Those are two very crafty young ladies who won't get in a car with a young man by himself, etc., etc. And I'd win the bet because I knew how to defuse the situation. Even if they asked, where are you headed? Right? And they had a sign saying where they're going, but they'd ask, or if they, even if they didn't, they'd say, where are you headed? And I had ways of developing it to where they wouldn't get suspicious. But I didn't mean I was going to kill them. It meant I was playing a game. And then later, when I started killing people, I used that against them. But initially, it was just a hobby, it was a habit, it was trying to fill in the blanks of five and a half years of not being in society. I missed that flower child generation. I missed the entry into Vietnam, all that stuff. And all these kids are like aliens to me. Yeah, I say kids. I missed 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. I'm supposed to be associating with people in their adult years. But I missed a big chunk, so I'm out there trying to fill in the gaps. Find out why these kids are the way they are now, because they were totally different from the kids that I was... When I was that age, totally different. And I'm trying to fill the gaps in, and then later I changed that to something ugly. And why? My mother works at the university. My mother won't introduce me to any young ladies at the university because I'm like my father, and I don't deserve to know any of those young ladies. So here she is holding these little girls up there as too good for me, very special. If anything, I was destroying icons. I was hurting her without her even knowing it. Again, it's that picky, you little petty, uh, ineffectual, I'm getting back at you, but I don't have the heart to tell you what I'm doing. See? Why would I admit those things on a camera? That's embarrassing. It's humiliating. And how would you select your victims? Were there... I didn't select them. It was random. And it was uh, also the, the development of the passion. If I was drove, they died. Like the last two victims. I was so pissed I'd have killed anybody who got in a car.
You said you had a lot of sympathy and empathy towards Marianne Pesce when you talked to her. But isn't that strange to say that after you had killed her in such a brutal fashion? There was a draw. There was a draw to the young lady. It was haunting. I'm not saying I had compassion toward her when I talked to her. I tried to remember what we talked about. And in fact, I think it, what I said about her was is that she epitomized what really drove me. She was a haughty young lady. She's kind of stuck up, distant. I look back on it and I see a girl that was not beautiful, she was not plain, she was somewhere in between, and she was caught up in that beauty thing, like kids in the valley are, okay? Valley girls, trying to make something of themselves and exploit little attributes they have and to downplay other ones. And she was playing a little Miss Distant with me. And her friend was very open and very, her roommate was very open and very a country girl talking and stuff. And it's sad because the Pesh was the, uh, Marianne was the uh, expert at hitchhiking. She had been half her life in Europe. She'd hitchhiked around Europe. Uh, she'd done it in the United States. She was good at it. She didn't want to get in the car. The other girl, Anita Luchessa, wasn't a hitchhiker. She'd been raised by her family. You don't do things like that. That's totally out of line. And her friend talked her into it. And once she got into it and she saw how much fun it was and they meet the different people and they talk with people, that by the time they're leaving Berkeley, right, it's all about who gets the front seat and who gets the back seat. So she, she, uh, you know, she opened the door and asked where uh, I was headed. And it says Stanford right on their, the sign they were holding up. And I said, I'm going to Palo Alto. I can drop you off. Oh, great. And she jumps in, grabs her stuff, jumps in, opens the back seat up for her friend, who's standing there looking at me long and serious about whether or not, because I could tell at the time, she knows better than to get in. Single adult, it's a coupe instead of a four-door car, so she cannot get out other than through the front seat. So that's all the warning signs of not getting in with a single, you know, in that kind of a situation. Uh, all of the things were wrong about it. But when I drove up, I pulled that little stunt of looking at my watch. You know, do I have time to pick them up? And you wouldn't believe how much effect that kind of thing has. And when she kept staring at me and looking, looking for something wrong in my eyes, I gave this look back like, I don't understand. Why, why are you looking at me like this? I gave her that back and she says, oh, this guy's a dork. He's innocent as hell. She gets in. Okay. We're driving along and I'm looking at this young lady in the rearview mirror. And I look back at it years later and I'm saying, she kept looking me back too, right in the eyeballs. I'm wearing dark glasses, but they're not totally dark. And I'm realizing now that she could see me looking at her and she was looking right back at me. And instead of saying something to me like, what are you looking at? Or, hey, maybe you ought to drop us off or something like that. She just kept looking back at me and I'm looking at her and she keeps looking at me. And I'm thinking she's playing this little game. It's, uh, it's not really teasing so to speak. It's just this little psychological game back and forth that men and women do sometimes. The young girl in the front, uh, Anita, was uh, at one point in the, in, the, in the driving, and I'm sure they were doing little looks at each other and little comments that I didn't pick up because I'm driving and looking for places to go. That uh, somewhere in that communication, she gave me this sexy little look, you know, like, oh boy, you know, you're a pretty good looking guy, you know, da da da. And uh, I smiled back at her but not this hungry, oh, ah, yeah, yeah, I'd like to get down with you kind of thing. It was just I smiled back at her, and I saw it for what it was. It's an 18-year-old girl that's feeling her oats. She's not doing anything wrong. It's, it's sad and it's real pathetic, but some of this stuff was, I was getting real caught up in this girl in the back seat. You know, I was, uh, she was, you know, to me, at that point, she was really beautiful. She had the most incredible blue eyes, right? She had this really shiny black hair that was turning me on. And I was getting drove because I just kept playing this game of picking people up and, and I had plugged in those fantasies of killing people. And, you know, the titillating little fantasies. And I says, geez, uh, I keep walking away from that. And I put myself down as being weak for not being able to do something about that. Right? So I kept driving and driving on myself saying, I got to do something. I got to do something about this. How were you feeling while you were killing? What? Well, you said especially the first two, which were very messy. It was a shock that first time. That horrified me. I did everything stupid, everything wrong, if I were trying to get away with it. It was just really, really dumb. The knife I fell back on, that was a fallback position. I was trying to smother her. That didn't work. 
and she was struggling against that and arguing with me about it and uh, uh, I got frustrated and I reached in my pocket I had that folding knife and I pulled it out and for a lot of years and I, I made a point of saying back then with the investigators when I pulled the knife out and locked it in a place it clicked and she said what's that that's a quote what's that and she was kind of like a yeah, yeah naggy kind of thing what's that and I couldn't figure out why she said that like it's not that big an impact a little clicking sound behind her you know amongst what's going on and it hadn't been murderous up to that point it had been an aggravation and I was I had her tied up or handcuffed and uh, uh, it took me years to, for it to dawn on me trying to look at it from different points of view to understand these things why she said that you know why she said that because I had brandished this gun and I had cocked it once and it clicked so in her mind very possibly I had pulled the gun out and was going to shoot her so she said what's that and thinking I pulled the gun out now and I'm cocking it not realizing I'd pulled a knife out I still had the gun in my pants I stabbed her she didn't fall dead you're supposed to fall dead you're supposed to go oh and fall dead I've seen it in all the movies right doesn't work that way when you stab someone they leak to death they lose blood pressure and you stab them more and more and more you complicate it many times by where you're hitting the pain you're causing and the aggravation of the person involved plus whether or not they leak a little faster it wasn't working worth the damn I stabbed her all over her back and she even turned around I stabbed her in the side and the stomach once why as she turned around I could have stabbed her through the heart but her breasts were there and it actually deflected me I couldn't see stabbing a young woman in her breast that's embarrassing I didn't say that to them back then I don't think I may have but that's humiliating to admit that that I was that affected by her presence I stabbed her in the belly that had to hurt worse I didn't do it to make it hurt I was trying to shut her up and she ended up getting her th throat cut and uh, I learned the term ear to ear what that meant because that's the way it went and uh, she went out of it completely right then she lost consciousness and uh, died probably just moments after that but I just backed up out of the car my hands are covered in blood and I'm saying oh god I did it I did it I don't believe it I did it shit I've done it now I gotta kill the other one and at, toward the end when I picked those two girls up and I said they were just like the first two like Marianne Passion and Anita Luchessa who haunted me all this time and now two more just like them get in the car we drive up 13 and we get to this figure eight uh, cloverleaf interchange where it hits 580 and they want to go under the freeway and back up on and head out this way and out that way I happen to know just a couple of miles down the road is Palomares Drive where I took Anita Luchessa and Marianne Pesci and killed them Mills College is back this way toward downtown they don't think so they want to go this way I'm saying gee you don't want to go that way and I can't tell them why you do not want to go that way Mills College is this way well no we we go there and we know where it's we live there and, and uh, we want to go and as we're approaching this interchange I'm saying no we need to go in the right lane get up on the freeway and go downtown you want to get in the left lane go under cross up and that's going to be another step closer to you dying because even if I don't go all the way out to Palomares Road up 580 if I stop where it starts to go out in the country and I get back on the freeway that's where I used to work on the highways that's one of the places where it's a cul-de-sac you drive down there it's a very quiet street comes down up onto the freeway very sharply and they're dead if these urges take over and if I go that way it's not encouraging me to stop it's testing beyond where I want to test we've already gone beyond that by them getting in the car because geez it's just like those first two I was actually scared to death I was gonna kill him and I by that point I had killed all of the co-eds it was two months after the last two and I'm seeing if I can pull out of it like like drinking or something or smoking and at the point where we're bickering if they'd started shrieking or banging on the windows I'm busted they're gonna pull me over someone's gonna call a cop or something and they're gonna get me and probably bust me on these other cases on a fluke and I'm trying to save their lives I don't want them going that way because I know Mills College is this other way they get scared shitless and, oh my god we shouldn't have gotten this guy's car and they're getting all puckered up and, and 
And I said, just bear with me, be patient. If I'm wrong, we'll get on the turn off, we'll go right back around, we'll take you out your way. But I know it's the next turn off or the one past it, this way, downtown. Trust me, please. And they're sitting like this and they quit talking to me and they're looking straight ahead. And I'm saying, oh shit. Guns under the seat, it's all just, you know, whoa. I get up on the freeway, two turn offs, Mills College. In fact, the next one said Mills College, next exit, you know. But they're not, they're not relaxing or nothing. I had refused to take them the way they wanted to go and pushed it the other way. That's what scared them. But they didn't know the irony of it was if I'd have gone along their way, I'd have probably said, yeah, yeah, well, I'll just follow on through and oops, we'll do it one more time. How do you oops human lives? Two young, I don't know those two young ladies. And I don't know where they are today. And I don't know that they remember that little incident. But when I drove them to Mills College, inside of Mills College, to their college entrance, right to the building, to the dormitory. And they got out of that car and flew up those stairs. Never even looked back. I'll bet they quit hitchhiking quite so casually after that. But you know what? I don't think they know to this day how close that came. And, and the irony of it is, it, just, to, just to shut them up and not have them freak out, I could have gone the other way. But by that time, then we're going back up that groove of what I had done already and what I was familiar with. See what I'm saying? And that day, I knew I could not stop doing it. I knew I had no control over it. I had just minimal controls. But mainly, I could not stop it. It was going to happen again. And between that weekend day, it was a Saturday or a Sunday, I think it was a Sunday, between that Sunday and the next Saturday, all that week I was working, I built an image in my head, my mother's going to die. I'm going to kill her, and I am going to go to it with the police and we're going to hold court in the street and they're going to pound me in the ground and they can fill in the blanks because I don't want to be around to explain it. All that week, I just it was a conviction that just got deeper and deeper in me. I got more and more morose. I got less and less talkative at work. I got more somber about what I was doing because every, almost every minute of every day, I knew that's what that next weekend held. That was Easter weekend, right? Worked half a day Friday, went back to Santa Cruz Friday afternoon, was drinking Friday night, fell asleep before my mother came home, woke up after she came home. And the last words we had were an argument, right? I walked into her bedroom to chat with her. I was, I, in the back of my mind, I'm not going to try and blame her for dying, I'm just saying, in the back of my mind I was hoping she could say something or I'd say something that could stop all of this shit. A little childish hope in the back of my mind that she'd say something and I'd just I'd play it off. I'd, I'd but you still went with the hammer. You know? Wait a minute, wait a minute. You're, you're wiping out the moment here. I went in there hoping I could stop this stuff in the back of my head. I'm not planning on it. I'm just a little hope. And the first thing out of her mouth was she's reading this book and she just flaps it down on herself and says, Oh my God, I suppose now you want to stay up all night and talk. That was one of her favorite peeves when I come in late at night and want to talk. And once in a long while, like that night, I spun on my heel and said, nope, good night, and walked back out. And she knew she'd hurt my feelings, and the next day we'd sit down and talk. Except I knew that we weren't going to talk. And I went back in my room and I laid down, I did not go to sleep, I laid there for four, well, three hours, four hours, till four, five in the morning. A little after five in the morning and walked in there with a hammer. And caved in the side of her head and cut her throat.